welcome and thank you for attending and tuning in. I'd like to thank QLOC and the working parties, particularly the Teaching and Learning Support Working Party and the Copyright Practitioners Group for facilitating this webinar this afternoon. There is a global move movement for open education, both in academic practice and in resources for learning and teaching. Today, we're welcoming Dr. Rajiv Jangiani from Kwantlen Polytechnic University, British Columbia, to QUT, where he is a special advisor to the Provost on Open Education, a psychology instructor and researcher on open education and the scholarship of teaching and learning. Rajiv is also the author of psychology and open education publications, including the book Open, the philosophy and practices that are revolutionizing education and science. Rajiv came to Australia to participate in an OERU partners meeting and to visit several universities, in, including QLOC members, University of Southern Queensland and QUT. Rajiv is very engaged in this space as a researcher, practitioner, university advisor and advocate. And today he will help us understand both in the context of library support services. There are two parts to open education, practices, OEP, and content, OER. Central to open education practice is content. There is a lot of talk about moving beyond the textbook. And in our central role as a provider of learning resources, the library is actively considering how to make textbooks available to students. There are new models that range from providing the traditional textbook in electronic format to creating custom texts and course packs in online platforms through commercial publishers and e-learning companies through to adopting open textbooks. A particular direction of the textbook issue is the consideration of zero cost to students. Today, Rajiv will, I'm sure, give us plenty to think about and talk about. Experience shows us that we should consider and discuss opportunities with a growth mindset. And in that spirit, I'm sure we will come out of this webinar today better informed about open education. And now I'll hand you over to Rajiv. Thank you, Narada. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Very sweet. Um, I'm hoping uh, that I'm coming through for the 31 people I see floating around the webinar right now, um, but also, just because of the awkwardness of this space and this island in the middle, I'm going to come rather closer to you than you might be comfortable with. I hope that's okay. I'd rather not be hidden behind the, behind the podium. Um, so really, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, uh, Nerida mentioned my university. I work at Kwantlen Polytechnic University in British Columbia. Um, the university itself is, uh, um, uh, is, uh, resides on the traditional unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples. Um, and of course, I start with that acknowledgement because that's an important part of truth and reconciliation uh, in Canada. Um, within uh, this country, it's been fascinating uh, over the last week or so to visit, this is the 10th university uh, I visited or had discussions or presented at. And it's been quite marvelous to see just how much interest there is, how much activity there already is, and in a sense, how much potential there is. Because I don't think people fully appreciate just how much energy and activity and interest there already is in this country. Uh, it is no accident that oh, the home of open education at most universities in the world uh, is in fact the library. So what I'm hoping to do in this session is provide some introduction to open educational resources and open educational practices, but with a particular emphasis on how both might be supported from the library. Um, but before I begin, let me just say this. I think open education, if I were to define it, I think is a philosophy about the ways in which people should create, build upon and share knowledge. Proponents of open education believe that everyone should have access to high quality educational experiences and resources. And we work to remove barriers towards those goals, whether those barriers are high costs, uh, obsolete or outdated materials, or in some cases, even legal mechanisms that inhibit or prevent sharing among scholars and educators. And if open education sounds like a bit of a radical idea, it really probably shouldn't, uh, because of course, we are now at the, about the 40th anniversary of the declaration of the signing of the declaration of the uh, 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 Universal Declaration of Human Rights by the UN. And Article 26 in that document, of course, lays out this language that everyone should have uh, equal access to higher education. But of course, as I'm sure you know, that's far from the truth. We're really quite far from that in terms of the hundreds of millions of school children who are out of school or school aged children 
who are out of school, and the number of ter tertiary education students who don't quite have the skills that we hope they would have, and that even higher education institutions across the world really need to be able to serve about 100 million additional students over the next 10 years than we actually have seats for. So we're still struggling to try and deliver on this space. Even in Canada, as, as is the case over here, I think we're struggling because when you look at the structure of higher education, you often find that on the one hand, higher education is this vehicle for economic and social mobility, right? amazing tool with which we can unlock human potential. But if you examine the structure, you often see all of the many ways in which it's structured to replicate and reinforce existing power structures. In North America, one of the most blatant ways in which this is done is a practice called legacy admissions where the children of people who've attended university are far more likely to be admitted. The barrier, uh, the threshold for entry is much easier. And of course, even something as mundane and subtle as textbook costs, uh, which of course I'm going to talk about. This is a wonderfully interesting, rather amusing uh, <laughs> picture. My alma mater is the University of British Columbia, and they had this marketing campaign a few years ago where they wanted to celebrate their graduates. So they put these posters on the ground around campus and they gave markers to the students. They said, fill in your most memorable experience. I really don't think that's what they were going for. But of course, that's the picture that went viral. But here's what's behind that. In the United States, about two thirds of students require a student loan to be in the classroom. In Canada, it's about 50%. In both countries, average student debt is in the region of $30,000 or so. And in Canada, five years after having graduated, barely a third of them have managed to free themselves from the shackles of that debt. Now, as a psychologist, I'm really interested not just in the financial implications of this, but also the mental health implications. We don't quite have the progressive repayment structure that you do in Australia, where it's only triggered, repayment is only triggered once students who, once they've graduated, uh, earn a certain amount. Of course, even that's changing. Right? It used to be $55,000 that triggered the automatic repayments from students having that loan, the help loans now, but now it's lower to 45,000. And these are some data that might fascinate you. The government a year ago forecasted that the student loan debt that was outstanding in this country was gonna be $9.3 billion lower than what it actually is. It is growing. And I know that it seems like it's an accepted part of, of experiencing higher education over here, you lean on these loans, it gets paid back, of course, but it's growing as a problem. Now, in the midst of all of this, it feels almost anticlimactic to be talking about something as mundane as textbooks, right? Because of course, even in Vancouver, especially, cost of living is a huge burden for students to bear. Tuition, of course, transportation, all of these are larger in other, in other ways. But we focus on textbooks within the open education movement for a couple of reasons. One is the issue of control. For one, we don't control as individual educators, tuition, cost of living, transport, we do control the cost of required course materials. And thank goodness for academic freedom, we're the only person, I'm the only person who can make that choice for my students. But the other is that there's remarkably no other consumer good, period, that has risen in cost as much as commercial textbooks have. They began collecting data in 1977, between then and 2018, it's gone up by more than 1,000%. It's very consistently been between three and four times the rate of inflation. It is incredible. And certainly as a faculty member, perhaps some of you also are familiar with this practice, we keep receiving these unsolicited packages from commercial publishers in our mailboxes, where there are new editions with more or less cosmetic changes that the students are beholden to, of course. So we know these practices exist. <coughs> and we now live in the era of the $400 textbook. That's not nice. Tuition for one course at my institution is about $400, and students are being asked in some cases to spend as much on a book as they are for their tuition. This is not, not an isolated example. Here's another one. Definitely picking on one publisher today, though. And I really think there's only one appropriate reaction to a $400 textbook. And I think this is it. <laughs> I love that reaction. But here's the crux of it. Students really can't learn from books that they can't afford. It's not just a question of cost savings and expense and debt. This is what we're seeing. These are the best data we have. This, come from, this comes from the state of Florida where they've done this survey a few times now, most recently in 2016, 
The sample of this survey is more than 22,000 students. They're drawn from every single degree granting institution in the state. And what they're showing us is what we're seeing in the rest of North America, that a majority of students, in this case about two thirds, are reporting that they're not buying at least one of their required course textbooks because of cost. That's how that sentence ends in the survey. Nearly half are choosing courses or registering for specific sections of courses based on textbook costs. And of course, dropping a course or failing a course. But I wanna pause on this one, the fact that 37.6% of them are earning a poor grade in a course. Because this is the real calculus of the undergraduate degree now, at least in North America. Students are trying to figure out how much of my grade is coming from an access code that's tied to a new textbook, an access code that is associated with an online homework platform or some other publisher platform. If it's 10% of my grade that's coming from that access code, I'll take the hit on my grade and I'll buy an older edition. But the access codes only come with the new editions of the books. So if it's 35%, I'm going to take another course. I'll have to drop this course. This is some of the ridiculous reasoning we're seeing that our students forced into. Certainly in DC, but in the rest of North America, students have really woken up to this and they've used a hashtag on social media. So if you search for the hashtag textbook broke, you'll often see students at the start of every semester tweeting out, sharing photographs of the receipts, showing how much they've spent on textbooks for a single four month semester. Um, this is textbook broke BC because that's British Columbia, but you see the same thing across Canada. I spent $650 on textbooks. I could have spent that on rent. That's in Alberta, textbook broke Alberta. Keep going, Saskatchewan. I just spent $750 on textbooks, textbook broke Saskatchewan. I'd rather spend my money on food. And there's a parallel. Because one thing we know is that students have little choice about spending money on tuition. They can't say I'm not gonna pay tuition. They can say, I'm not gonna buy those required textbooks. Similarly, they can't say I'm not gonna pay my rent, but they can say I'm going to starve myself. And they do. This is why food insecurity is such a growing issue. This is a nationally representative survey. Close to 50% of students in this survey reported some degree of food insecurity in the preceding 30 days. The food pantry at the University of British Columbia, my alma mater once again, has seen a 100% increase in its use by students over the last few years. This is something that's growing as well. Unfortunately, of course, faculty still suffer from what is known as a principal agent problem. They are the ones who make a choice about required textbooks. They're not the ones who have to buy those books. So they often don't even know the cost of the books that are signing, which is quite horrifying. I know in Australia, it's a bit different. You have legislation or at least language in your Higher Education Act that requires universities to provide reasonable access to course materials. It's interesting to see across the country how this is operationalized differently. Some institutions seem to think that that means one copy in the library per 50 students, others one per 30 students. It seems to be sort of up for interpretation. But even that seems wonderful from our perspective because we have no such a requirement at all. So this is the Australian context. These are articles from Australian newspapers which for the last couple of years have been interrogating this idea about the rising cost of textbooks over here. You might be surprised to learn that in Australia by itself, as of a year ago, the commercial textbook market is worth about $400 million. That's where that's going. Here's another one. Why are textbooks so expensive in Australia? And I know we've got some friends at RMIT also uh, who've been involved in these initiatives. This is a student, Abina Dove, at RMIT. This is what she was quoted as saying in that article. She budgets by buying non-perishables, by cooking really, really cheap food. She lists canned tuna as a staple in her diet, for example. She's living from paycheck to paycheck. So when I read these stories, when I see what's happening over here, to me, it's very similar to what's been happening in North America, except it's not quite as well known and the pressures are only now starting to ramp up, even in terms of the implications for student debt. And I did wanna pause quickly and talk about digital delivery of course materials. That's been a big push from commercial publishers because if you sit them down when they knock on your office door unsolicited, hawking their latest wares, you invite them in and you say, I wanna talk about affordability. They will typically say, well, that's why we have soft cover versions of the book. That's why we have loose leaf binder versions of the books. That's why we have eBooks. And this is where I want to suggest that digital textbooks coming from commercial publishers are very much a sheep, well, a wolf in sheep's clothing anyway. There's a number of reasons why. For one, students never buy e-textbooks, they lease them. 
They have access for 90 days, 120 days. At the end of that, access expires. So the student who's taking anatomy and physiology who wants to perhaps go on to medical school cannot keep that book as a reference. They will lose access. Second, because they cannot buy the book, really, they're leasing it, they can't resell the book. So students assigned e-textbooks often end up spending more than they would if they bought a physical copy and were able to resell it. Third, digital rights management means that the books have all sorts of restrictions, copying, pasting, printing, which means that it's very difficult to reformat these books for students who have, let's say, visual impairments. DRM is a whole separate set of issues. Again, very careful about this. The latest iteration of this is a kind of initiative that's known as inclusive access, which is very clever branding. It's sort of like when the Americans called um, a piece of legislation the Patriot Act. It wasn't especially patriotic, but of course, if you brand it as such, it's an attempt to define by naming. Inclusive access is where the institution signs a deal with a commercial publisher. Faculty have to restrict their choice of textbooks to the platform, to the uh, titles within the publisher's platform, for example. Students have no agency at all. They cannot choose not to participate. It's very difficult for them to opt out of such deals. Uh, typically, the number of students who are able to opt out is really limited and it's made very, very challenging. So there's a reduction in academic freedom. There's a reduction in student agency. And of course, we can talk about the costs. And overall, I will say, this is what I think inclusive access looks like, especially when you consider that it's a bit similar to this. I view commercial publishers, especially the ones who've been operating with the kinds of profit margins they have, with the kinds of malpractices they have, as a bit like serial arsonists. And perhaps I'm peculiar, but I don't really think it's a good idea to go to a, a serial arsonist and, and see if I can lease or rent a fire extinguisher from them. It's not a case of, well, you can trust us now. Instead, I'm a huge proponent of open educational resources. But I think even those who've been working in open education sometimes still mix up what OER really means. When something is free and online, it doesn't make it open. Right? CNN.com is free and online, but it's certainly not open. It's fully copyrighted content. And being open doesn't even mean that the copyright holders are giving up their copyright. They still have copyright. They're simply choosing in advance how they're comfortable with other people using their work. So when we talk about open, we're really talking about free, yes, but freedom at the same time. And specifically, five permissions, five freedoms that you wouldn't have had before. These are called the five R's of OER. So the ability to reuse content, so free, unfettered reuse, you don't have to email somebody to request permission to use it in your context. The permission is embedded within the license itself. But then as faculty members, we can revise and remix content. So you can adapt it for your local context. You don't have to tell students, don't read chapter three, take it out. If there's something missing, add it in. If you want to contextualize it, local examples, local statistics, weave your assignment through it, feature research from your research labs, do whatever you want. You can move away from bending your courses to map onto the table of contents of a textbook. Instead, you have more academic freedom. And of course, retain and redistribute. So those students are not going to lose access. They can keep it permanently, right? And of course, open is also not just digital. Open is very much available in print as well. So it's not just a conflation of that. And with print on demand available at very low cost for open textbooks, students don't have to choose between expensive print and lower cost, but still expensive digital. They get truly low cost print at the same time, which is generally what their preference is. Now, OER can be any, any sort of teaching and learning resource as long as it's published with an open license, right? Could be images like the public domain images that come out of the Rights Museum. So if you wanna look at Vincent van Gogh's masterpieces, high resolution images are now in the public domain thanks to the Rights Museum, or videos, or interactive simulations. But of course, textbooks as well. And I'm pointing to the open textbook library because that's one of the biggest repositories, curated repositories of open textbooks. Uh, it's more than 500 titles in that repository right now. And I'm delighted to say that uh, thanks to the assistance of colleagues at QUT and a wonderful faculty author uh, at the University of New South Wales, this is one of the latest additions uh, to the open textbook library. Uh, it's hidden over here at our screen, but it's learning statistics with R uh, and it's by Danny Navarro, who's at the University of New South Wales. And Danny's an interesting case because she published this book on her website with rather strict copyright language around it, but she had it available for free on her website. So 
when I emailed her a few months ago to say, oh, we were both psychologists and this is wonderful. And of course, it's not just an open textbook, but it's an open textbook to teach statistics around an open source software program for statistics that the whole discipline is moving to. So it's this beautiful sort of uh, you know, convergence of openness. So I emailed her and I said, it's, it feels like you want people to access your work, but I'm seeing this language in here that sort of inhibits that. And it was interesting. She said she just didn't really, she wanted to share it, but she wanted to protect herself from commercial exploitation. But once she understood what the options were, she was able to choose a Creative Commons license that suited her. For example, with a share or like clause, if that means something to the people, yeah, to some of you. Uh, and I had a great uh, opportunity to meet with Danny last week on the 8th of November when I was in Sydney uh, and celebrate her. It was funny. The, uh, librarians at the University of New South Wales, who I met with later that afternoon, of course, had no idea that they had this open textbook champion in their midst. So I dragged her to the meeting, introduced her, and I was like, you need to celebrate this person. And that's what's happening. I think so many faculty are, are already embracing open educational practices. We just don't necessarily know about them. But it's not that uncommon. I also wanted to share this example of an open textbook, not because it's in the open textbook library, but because this is one that is, or at least the previous version is in the Open Textbook Library. You see the Open Textbook Library is based in, at the University of Minnesota in the United States. So they had a book for research methods in psychology that was a US edition. Indeed, how oh, fun. Um, but because of the permissions to revise and remix, I was able to adapt that book for the Canadian context where laws governing uh, research with human participants are a bit different and also deal with some more recent issues in my discipline concerning replicability. So what you're seeing over here is now the second Canadian edition, which I worked on with my colleague, Ai Chen Chiang. The book, as you can see, is available in a wide variety of digital formats entirely for free, but of course in print as well. So a 400 page book, and I think our dollars are about at par at the moment, is available for, to my students for about $13 in print. It's phenomenal, so it's not a barrier. This is what I saw in my anonymous course evaluations the first semester I began ad adopting this book. And you can see that some students love, of course, all of them love that it's free or that it's accessible and convenient. They don't have to choose between formats. It's all affordable. But I love that comment in the middle. Right? Those are the students again. I'm interested in equity. I'm interested in social justice. And that's the student I really want to reach. But this is anecdotal. And I want to share that there's actually more than 25 peer reviewed studies that have looked at the impact on educational outcomes of open textbook adoption. There's a range of them. Uh, some of them at large institutions like the University of British Columbia, some of them like this one over here at my institution in the United States and Canada, different disciplines. And it's incredible. Virtually all of them say the same thing, same thing, which is that students assigned free and open textbooks typically perform the same as those assigned expensive commercial textbooks. And where they perform differently, the students assigned free open textbooks outperform those assigned expensive commercial. And it's really just the access hypothesis that the students who wouldn't have bought the book, who would have maybe waited until the first exam to buy the book to see if they can navigate the course without, that uh, is driving that result. This study in particular on the bottom right is one I'll point to. This is a recent one published out of the University of Georgia earlier this year. It's a very large study. And one of the things they found was just as we know that the burden of high textbook costs are disproportionately borne by already marginalized students, the benefits in terms of course performance, those gains are occurring disproportionately for those same marginalized students. So students of color, students who are first in their family to attend university, those who are holding a loan or those who are eligible for a Pell Grant, which is a measure of SES, uh, socioeconomic status in the United States, are all showing gains in course performance when they're assigned open textbooks. So the evidence is building. If you're interested in, in this research, I'll encourage you to go to the website of the Open Education Group, uh, where all of this research, they don't just con they, they conduct this research, but they also collate research on this subject from everywhere else in the world. Uh, so you can certainly read through these articles yourself if you're interested. And then of course, there are universities like mine that are doing a bit more. There are lots of places that have open textbook adoptions at this point, right? In British Columbia, 90% of universities adopt open textbooks actively. And if I point to just one project of open textbooks in the United States, OpenStax, which is based at Rice University, they have about 25 open textbooks for the highest enrolled courses in the United States. Their books alone have been adopted by 48% of all US post-secondary institutions. It's incredible the market penetration that we're seeing now with open textbooks in North America. But at KPU, we decided to go further 
and build pathways to, for students to earn credentials, <coughs> entire credentials, where they don't have to spend a single cent on textbooks all the way through. And with the average cost of textbooks being about $110 in Canada, this is the equivalent of giving every student who goes through that program a $1,000 scholarship every year, effectively. This is powerful. And of course, we've gone further. We've made it so that even at the point of registration, students can actually search for courses that have zero textbook costs because of OER. At the point of registration, it's integrated within our timetable. This, of course, involves active partnerships with every corner of the university, in this case, the registrar's office as well. And it's not just that, uh, you know, this is a feel-good story. The data reflect this and make sense. It shows us that this investment is wise. Consider this, this is just the first year we launched in January of this year, and we already have more than 350 sections, more than 100 instructors participating. This is entirely voluntary, right? This is not being mandated in any way, but we support it where there's interest. A lot of departments, a lot of students to be sure, and in just the first year already, more than $1.2 million in savings for students just from textbook costs. And one of the big questions, of course, is, is it the case that students who save all of this money when they don't have to spend $800 on textbooks that semester, for example, are they having to work less? So are they doing better in school, more hours to study? Or are they channeling some of those savings back into taking one additional course? So they're actually completing their degree sooner. Data in the United States suggests that that's exactly what happens, but we're, we're tracking that right now. What I can tell you is that we're seeing an impact on course outcomes. Here are eight courses. These are eight courses that had some instructors participate in the initiative with zero textbook costs and some not. So I was actually able to compare outcomes for the same course, even if it's taught by different instructors. There's not even one exception. Students in the open textbook sections are outperforming those on average in the commercial textbook sections. And when you dig further, you see it actually boils down to more students earning A's and B's in the zero textbook cost sections and fewer students earning C's and D's. So the real shift in the grade distribution over here. And it's data like this that really helps us understand the impact on the institution of a small initiative like this that's fairly easy to implement, really. Not expensive for us to implement, certainly. But we're seeing the dividends for the institution. I also wanted to point to QUT for a moment. Because I think it's very easy for all of us, even if you're not from QUT, to look at the strategic planning documents of your institution and identify and highlight language that supports the work of open education. In some cases, it's work, it's language around access, right? Uh, in other cases, it's, it's language around student success. And in yet other cases, it's language around pedagogical innovation. So here's just a quick illustration. Um, this is from your blueprint at QUT. Apologize for the small font over here. I was trying to squeeze it all in. But for example, Transform our approaches to teaching and learning to meet the learning needs of diverse groups of students and equip them to thrive throughout their lives. Okay. Enable people from diverse communities to fully participate in tertiary study. Continue to transform our courses and develop new teaching or learning and teaching approaches to drive change. And that's where we'll talk about open pedagogy momentarily. And use and develop technology solutions that enhance learning. It's not hard to do this, right? Because pretty much every institution, even though we all think we're unique, it's a bit like, you know, buzzword bingo when it comes to these mission statements. We'll find the same language everywhere. We all care about the same things. So I wanted to pause just for a moment for the online group also, but for the people in the room. And given the introduction I've provided at this point, I'd like you to consider if you were in an elevator with someone at your institution who knew nothing about open education. Think in your mind how you might articulate what the benefits would be for three constituents. One, for students. Two, for faculty. And third, for the institution as a whole. And I'm actually gonna ask you to turn to someone seated beside you and spend only about 30 seconds per person on one of these. You don't have to do all three, but spend 30 seconds and think about what your 30 second elevator pitch might be. Whether it's around, for example, uh, if you're talking about students, you might talk about access and social justice and cost savings. If it's for faculty, you might talk about things like pedagogical innovation and students' improved performance. If it's for institutions, you might talk about retention and course performance, and of course, service to the community or access. It depends. But I'm gonna pause over here and ask, for those of you online, I'm gonna ask that you actually type out one sentence as your pitch over the next minute or so each and share that in the chat. 
but I'm going to stop now and wait for you guys to start. It feels like this was in a conversation that can easily roll on. But I want to try and lasso everyone's attention back. Thank you for doing that. I know it's always awkward when a presenter asks you to do something interactive, but trying to think about this, not that this was your polished elevator pitch, but at some point, this is where you might be. We really only have 30 seconds with someone to get across the crux of the message. And of course, part of what I'm trying to get at over here is it really, your message depends on who's in that elevator with you, right? And the language sometimes needs to be adjusted depending on who the audience is. But there are these benefits for all of these different groups. And to be able to understand that and articulate that is really handy. The other thing I'll say is, especially when you're communicating with faculty or looking at really culture change within a body of faculty, you're dealing with a very, very heterogeneous group, right? Faculty are certainly not homogenous. And I wanted to share this with you. This is the pencil metaphor. And it's really a way of, of mapping out, uh, you know, Roger's curve of diffusion of innovation in an educational context. I shared this some years ago um, at, at when I was giving a talk, when I was talking about open education. And I think it's handy. If you think about people who are sort of the leading edge of the pencil or the lead, if you will, these are the people who will innovate no matter what not even just despite support, they will innovate despite active opposition, right? Then you get the people who follow them, who are the sharp ones. And in some sense, both of these groups together are the early adopters, but the sharp ones see the potential and they'll follow. Of course, most people are the wood, the people who would adopt something like this if it was easy, if it was convenient, if it was not especially complicated, if the university supported it, if the university recognized their work for things like tenure and promotion, that's the wood. And of course you have, you know, the erasers at the end, but you always have the erasers at the end and yay academic freedom and I'm not going to care about them. It doesn't matter. Right? But I think understanding this, you have to think about how uh, in, from the library, you might move forward. And so I wanted to share a, 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 a set of strategies. There's actually 12, about a dozen strategies that I've seen work quite effectively, especially coming out of libraries. So that's what I'm going to share with you next. This is very nuts and bolts stuff. First is really very straightforward. Just have to identify the people who are already doing what you want others to do. You already have them, right? These are people who are using open educational resources without knowing what an open educational resource is, right? These are people who are assigning TED Talks, which are OER in the context of their teaching and learning. These are people who are using public domain data sets uh, or open data sets or assigning uh, open access articles for their upper level courses. These are people who are already using OER, perhaps some of them already open textbooks. Identifying them is really, really critical. Helping them appreciate that what they're doing is open education, right? Getting that self-identification is really key. So this is not difficult to do because you're simply identifying existing practice. This is no behavior change required at all, but you already have them, but we just don't know who they are. Second, of course, before you try to expand the set who are already doing what you're hoping others would do, you need to make it easier for the wood. And one of the ways we make it easier for the wood is by enhancing the discoverability of OER. And if we're talking about open textbooks, one very straightforward thing that one can do is go to a place like the open textbook library, uh, which I showed you earlier, because what they've done is they've provided public domain stamped mark records for their entire collection of 500 plus textbooks bring them into your library catalog. There are openly licensed libguides if you're into that sort of thing, uh, which you can again import. No need to reinvent the wheel. Make it easier. This is where liaison librarians, subject librarians have a huge role to play as well, is in figuring out two things. On the one hand, which are the highest enrolled courses in the areas I'm supporting? And B, for those highest enrolled areas, Within these open textbook repositories, which are the open textbooks that have already been rated very highly by a lot of faculty across a number of institutions, which have already been adopted by other institutions. You'll typically find that these books, like the ones from OpenStax, for example, those 25 books, are very well supported with the ancillary resources that faculty are accustomed to, whether it's question banks or slide decks or anything else. Start there. Start where it's easiest. My friend Nicole Allen often says, you know, you start with the low hanging fruit, but remember that eventually all the fruit do fall. Right? Start where it's easy. Don't make it difficult. One of the easy levers that we can, you can implement that's not especially expensive either is then as you're trying to get at the wood, the struggle is not in the quality of the resource because these resources are now incredibly high quality. 
They're often produced with a lot of peer review. The OpenStax project, for example, has a budget of about half a million dollars to produce each book. It's indistinguishable for a, from a commercial publisher's book. It's not about quality. It's about getting faculty to look at it. And so establishing a review program for open textbooks is powerful. So typically what institutions will do is they'll have a small honorarium for faculty to say, please, if you review any of the books in this, in this repository that are relevant to a discipline you teach, we want you to not just look at it, but write a review. There are standardized rubrics that are used across the movement now with about 10 different dimensions from currency to comprehensiveness to cultural relevance and other things like that. They write a review, they submit it, say to the open textbook library. Those reviews are published no matter what the faculty member says because they really want, we all want transparent and honest reviews. And right? if you think it's a terrible book, say it's a terrible book and tell us why you think it's a terrible book because then somebody will come along and fund the adaptation and improvement of that book. So we want honest feedback. But we know also that a majority, over 50%, about 55% of faculty who review, who write a review of an open textbook, end up adopting it. It's a very powerful level. And the major thing it really achieves is having the faculty look at the book in a small way, incentivize them looking at the book close enough. And then the book will speak for itself. Right? This is not a movement that's anything about trying to coerce people to use resources that are not good enough. It's not what anyone is interested in but there are resources that are excellent. It's just that there's nobody knocking on faculty's doors, promising to sponsor meetings or provide any kind of other incentive to adopt it. That's the struggle. And that's where liaison librarians come in. Next, if you can, this is more expensive, but establish an OER grant program. These are small grants that are offered by many, many institutions now, because sometimes faculty will say, well, it's pretty good, but there are some changes I would like to make before I can use it in my classroom. And of course, I don't have the time. So these small grants, which you know, at my institution is a couple of thousand dollars, sometimes $5,000, it depends, is enough to get to allow faculty to hire some student assistants or to use a little bit of time to be able to make those changes, for example. So small grants, they make a big difference when a small adaptation is required before a faculty member is comfortable adopting the book. Again, very, very effective. At my institution, we apply externally for these kinds of funds. And of course, we try to get the institution, whether it's the office of the provost or someone else, to match that funding to amplify it further. But that's something that is very, very common. And of course, six is supporting and recognizing the people who are doing all of the above. Definitely the, the people who are practicing open education already, but especially the people who start, who look, who review, who start you know, receiving these OER grants. The University of Southern Queensland, Adrian is with us. They have open educational practice grants, for example, that a number of their faculty have already received. And once you start celebrating these people, recognizing them publicly, it really encourages others who realize that, oh, wait a minute, this is not just going to be penalized. This is going to be supported. This is going to be recognized. Oh, this is something I could do. This is what really helps encourage others. It is really important, not just to uh, frame open educational resources in terms of this tinge of judgment about uh, you know, trying to avoid high textbook costs. It's more than that. It's aspirational. It's about what we could do with these resources that we couldn't do with anything else beyond the cost savings. And the reason why I'm talking about the importance of recognizing early adopters, not just anywhere, but at your institution is because I'm a psychologist and I'm going to use psychological jargon right now. Injunctive norms are when we describe what people ought to do. We ought to recycle, we ought to donate blood, we ought to agree to donate our organs after we pass away and so on, right? Ought. Any ought language is an injunctive norm. But when you tell people this is what you ought to do, that's not that persuasive. And in fact, if you say this is what people ought to do, when what people are actually doing is quite different, it backfires. I'll give you an example. So it's like saying, you know, you, we all ought to donate blood, in Canada, that's what Canadian Blood Service has done all the time, does all the time with their messaging. But then if you say something like, well, you know, 75% of Canadians who are eligible to donate blood actually don't donate blood. That's a mismatch. You ought to do this, but actually not very many people are doing it. And when most people hear that, what they hear is, oh my goodness, I no longer feel guilty. <laughs> that's not what was intended by the messaging. And that's what actually happens. It's a boomerang effect. What you want to do is saying, this is what you ought to do. And by the way, here's Danny Navarro at the University of New South Wales. Here's Jessica Stevens at QUT. Here is Nick Souza at QUT involved in an, in an open textbook project. That's what you need to do, right? Align those two kinds of norms. Not being crafty and just being a social psychologist. Number eight, 
This is increasingly common. Although the work centers in the library, it's not just up to the library. Campus open education working groups are cross-functional groups. They typically involve some administrators, some faculty, of course, librarians is a given, but often additional stakeholders. Could be the student association, could be the bookstore, and we can talk about partnerships with the bookstore for open education as well. Um, other places, the equity office. These are the groups that coordinate, adjudicate, administer the open education grants. These are the groups that, that help raise the awareness of open, of open educational resources during open education week, for example. These are the groups that are the hub of all of this activity. Nine, as I pointed to earlier, very clearly and explicitly, you should be very familiar with what language in your strategic planning documents you can lean on. So when you have those 30 seconds with the administrator in the elevator, and you get a colleague to maybe shut the elevator down from the outside so you've got more than 30 seconds, you know exactly what to say, not just your pitch, but how your pitch connects with the language that the institution has already collaboratively agreed to support. If this is the direction we're heading in, based on extensive consultation, I should be able to tell them exactly why and how this initiative supports that. So if I'm asking for matching funding for an OER grant program or anything else, be very ready to make that connection. 10, collect data. Collect data like there is no tomorrow. On the one hand, collect data right now. What is the impact of textbook unaffordability on your student population right now? Work with the student association, figure that out. How many of your students are not buying books? How many of your students are choosing courses based on uh, textbook costs? What's happening at your bookstore? Is what's happening there, what's been happening everywhere else, which is that textbook costs go up, student spending flat lines, which is that fewer and fewer students are buying books. Is it the case that the, that the QUT bookstore, for example, is also diversifying incredibly by relying on merchandise more than books in terms of sales? That would be familiar everywhere. Co collect the data. And once you've got those early adopters, of course, look at the impact on students, not just in terms of cost savings, but in terms of those critical metrics that administrators will want in terms of course performance and retention and completion rates. Do that, and again, in partnership with your institutional research office, for example. Collaborate internally and fiercely and proactively, right? Very proactively. Bookstores, absolutely. I mentioned, I think, that we've set up a print-on-demand service at my institution for open textbooks. Wonderful. The bookstore loves this because it's affordable print options for students, and when it's affordably priced, a lot more students buy it than would an expensive book. They can still add their profit margin per book, so they've got a revenue stream there. And they also have students coming to the bookstore now who wouldn't go otherwise, who wouldn't buy the books otherwise. And of course, that's where they see the merchandise. So you've got a couple of revenue streams. Bookstores like this. Teaching and learning centers know who the innovative pedagogues are. And they may be somewhat interested in the cost savings, but these are faculty who will primarily be interested in teaching and learning innovation, in doing things like open pedagogy, which I will describe next. And so the cost savings may be a bonus, even though it's incredibly important for students. So looking for that. At my institution, we've been running cohorts of faculty learning communities on open pedagogy, for example. And it's a bit of an overlapping subset. Some care about both social justice and pedagogical innovation. Some care more about innovation and academic leadership than cost savings. And that's fine. I wouldn't leave it just to those who really, really resonate with this on a social justice level for this initiative. There are many, many doorways, gateways to this work. Registrar, I mentioned earlier, absolutely student association and even the Office of Institutional Research. Once you start considering the benefits of actually marking your courses based on whether they have zero textbook costs or adopt OER, then institutional office, uh, institutional research office has a much easier time of actually tracking the data that you already want. Just one more field to check the box on. And of course, externally, not just internally. You can go quite quickly alone, but you can go much further together. At RMIT, Frank Pont and Anne Lennox have started, and it's spreading, of course, rapidly. The OER Librarians Network is now a thing in Australia. That's a group that you should consider joining, being a very active member in. There's, of course, the, I think it's the Australasian, perhaps, Open Educational Practice Special Interest Group. In North America, we have Spark, and they have a, a librarian's leadership program on OER which can certainly be adapted for this context as well. And then there's the Open Textbook Network, which has more than 600 campus members, mainly managed and driven by librarians. And I'm on that listserv. I can tell you every week there are questions that are asked, 
it's not just about resources. I'm looking for something for my faculty member this discipline and 20 people will reply helpfully. It's about specific challenges and strategies that are deployed and tested in different contexts as well. It's incredibly rich to participate in these networks. And with the Open Textbook Network, you actually have a member in Queensland already in the University of Southern Queensland. I'd suggest you consider joining as well. Beyond those 12 specific strategies, I'll also say there are tools like this. There's an Open Education Campus Action Plan. Uh, I recommend that you look at this. This is a document, a template that was drawn up by Spark that really helps kickstart thinking about who your key stakeholders are, where the barriers are. This work varies by your campus, where the institutional history is, where the landmines are, where the opportunities are. So you really have to contextualize any efforts to try and build support for open education on your campus. Um, and I should have said this at the start, I'm sorry, but uh, of course my slides are, are gonna be available openly. I'd be a ridiculous advocate for open if they were not. So I'm gonna put the URL where the slides can be gathered later today uh, at the end of my talk. So I'm not gonna pause here, but I will also say that if things go well, this is what can happen. The University of British Columbia, the big research institution in my backyard in, in, in Vancouver, uh, about a year and a half ago, revised their tenure and promotion policy. So now the creation of open educational resources and textbooks counts for tenure and promotion. Right? This is a game changer, but this also means that you don't have to be the first one. But having said all of this, I will say also that as important as resources are, as important as the cost savings to students are, the open education movement is not just about equitable access to knowledge, it's also about equitable access to knowledge creation. And this is where we're talking about open pedagogy. So open pedagogy is in fact one of the 10 directions where open education is, is heading in. It was recognized recently over the last year by the Cape Town plus 10, by the 10th anniversary of the Cape Town uh, Open Education Declaration. But what it really is, is it's, a, an access oriented commitment to student driven education. So instead of simply focusing on access, it focuses in equal parts on agency and, and trying to find ways to give more agency for students to give them more ownership and autonomy in their own learning. So this could be, for example, creating architectures for learning or using tools for learning that enable students to shape the public knowledge commons. I'll try and be concrete. But I will say that open pedagogy draws on open licensing on the one hand, but also critical pedagogy on the other. And critical pedagogy, as Henry Giroux writes, really asserts that students can engage their own learning from a position of agency. He writes, it takes seriously the educational imperative to encourage students to act on the knowledge, values, and social relations they acquire by being responsive to the deepest and most important problems of our times. Things like, for example, the Sustainable Development Goals outlined by the United Nations. So I'll show you this. This is not open pedagogy, but it's easier to understand what open pedagogy is in relief. This is actually an open educational resource, this image. This is a, an image from a French book from about 100 years ago that every page depicted a different scenario from the future. This is the classroom of the future. Actually, it's the classroom of the year 2000, so it's the classroom of the recent past. And I love this image because I think it's fascinating, the ideology that's embedded within it. Think about who is permitted to be the instructor? Who is permitted to be the student? And how is learning taking place? I mean, goodness, all of the things we know about active and experiential learning and pure interaction, none of that is on, on display, right? There's not even the need to take notes. It's just this electronic relay system that's transferring information to the students' minds. And of course, in case you missed it, you can see your graduate student teaching assistant over here doing the actual labor. <laughs> and it's easy to laugh at this, I think. But I think what's frightening in a sort of nervous laughter way is if you look at normative practice in higher education, it's actually not terribly different from that. We know how prevalent our reliance is on le large lectures, on how many faculty rely on publishers supplied question banks and use multiple choice questioning and nothing else. We know all of that. And we know the problems with a lack of not just diversity, but inclusion at our universities. This is very similar to what Paulo Freire, the Brazilian, described as the banking model of education, in which the model turns students into containers to be filled by the teacher, 
the more completely she fills the receptacles, he writes, the better a teacher she is. The more meekly the receptacles permit themselves to be filled, the better students they are. And so education thus becomes the act of depositing in which the students are the depositories and the teacher is the depositor. In this concept of education, knowledge is a gift bestowed by those who consider themselves knowledgeable upon those whom they consider to know nothing. And this happens a lot. We prescribe learning outcomes for students before we ever meet them. So I can tell you, this is what the journey is gonna look like because clearly you're not gonna influence the journey. So I can articulate this before I ever meet my class. That's a little strange, maybe, I don't know. Or course policies, but what if we helped choose some of the topics we will cover with our students? What if our students co-crafted course policies with us so that they own the policies? We don't have to enforce it if it's their policy, for example. And of course, what if we moved away from assignments that are largely disposable. Research essays, lab reports, oral presentations, any traditional assignment is something where the students will work for hours on it and the instructor is the only person who will see their work traditionally. Right? And we in turn spend hours providing careful, crafted, formative feedback for the students and only a fraction of them will actually look at that feedback as well. You put all of that together, the hours that students spend for one person, the hours that we spend for almost no one, Traditional assignments are sucking energy out of the world. But instead we could do this, right? We could achieve the same learning outcomes, even more, if we work with students, harness their energy, their potential, even their creativity, to have them produce resources for the commons. And we could start with one of the darkest corners of the internet for academia, right? It's like the 11th commandment of academia, thou shalt not cite Wikipedia, right? We know this. Psychology has about 9,000 articles on Wikipedia. Two thirds of those have been reviewed by Wikipedia's peer review standards, which are not probably ours. And 10% of those are considered good articles by Wikipedia, which are probably not our standards. So if we're concerned about reliability, we're not wrong. I'm not saying you're wrong. But what I'm saying is we are actively abdicating our responsibility when we know Wikipedia is the first port of call for the public, for our students, and occasionally for us. And there's nobody in a better position to edit it than faculty at higher education institutions with their students, right? Here's an example of a reliability problem. So if you visited this page about the first law of thermodynamics in 2012, you'd learn this. If you're familiar with the movie Fight Club, <laughs> yeah. But be, be like Amin Azam, faculty member at the University of California who works with his medical students these are people who will be general physicians, who will have to explain complex medical terminology to a lay audience in simple terms in a couple of minutes. He's making them practice by writing, editing, improving Wikipedia articles for medical topics. It's wonderful. It's a great service to the public, but that's secondary to their training. But that's what he can do. And it's not just Wikipedia. I mean, in general, digital literacy is in increasingly important. Mike Caulfield in Washington State has produced this wonderful guide, Web Literacy for Student Fact Checkers. He runs an initiative called the Digital Polarization Initiative, where students get to the root of stories get, that go viral and engage in fact checking for the general public. Very useful skills for them, wonderful public resource, of course. You could look at beyond writing. How about swapping out oral presentations where students produce these brief instructional videos this is an example of where students at Simon Fraser University in DC were asked to produce a brief video on Cialdini's principles of persuasion. Openly licensed. They won, yes, they won an international student award competition, right? That's 6,000 US, which is, what are we, you know, 45,000 Canadian or something at this point. And yes, recognition. But the point is their video is now being used to teach the science of persuasion by faculty around the world. And that's immensely powerful for the students. This is open pedagogy. Or instead of a research essay, work with your social science students to pick a problem that's afflicting your community. Take your knowledge, your budding knowledge, and write an op-ed piece. These are brief, 500 to 750 words, engaging, evidence-based, submitted for publication. Whether it's published or not, it might be. And imagine leaving the course with a publication, but more critically, leaving the course with the skills that you really will benefit from. Wonderful work. And of course, we can talk about open textbooks. On the left, you're seeing 
a, a screenshot of an open textbook in social psychology. And on the right, you're seeing students annotate open textbooks using an open source annotation tool called Hypothesis. And on the top, you're seeing one of my students, Lana, annotating this open textbook to share an example from her own life of a, a concept that's being discussed. She's augmenting the book. She's providing an additional example for her students in her cohort, but also future students who will read this book. The students are enriching the resource themselves. At the bottom, another student sharing an external resource, a video clip that she believes illustrates another phenomenon that's being discussed. So I no longer need to keep on top of what cultural references make sense to my students. Students are in the best position to do it. And they are enriching this open textbook every semester I use it. It's easy to do. Or instead of annotating, students can curate open content especially where you're teaching topics like early American literature, 14th to 16th century readings, and the readings are in the public domain, but the students can have more agency by selecting at least one of the topics or more of the topics that go into this. Yes, this will end up being an open anthology that could be used by other people. Robin DeRosa is a colleague who teaches in New Hampshire, but her students have helped choose the readings that went into now what is a wonderful public resource. So students can annotate OER, they can curate OER, they can adapt OER. Students at Brigham Young University, for example, were taking a course in, in instructional design. There was an open textbook for uh, project management, but it came from business. So these graduate students over the year, they were asked, they were tasked with taking out the case studies from business. Each of you write a case study in instructional design. They filmed videos, they made it interactive. At the end of one year, this cohort of graduate students republished the book as a derivative work project management for instructional designers. That book is now used as a textbook by other universities. Very powerful. And it's not just graduate students. These are undergraduate students at the Ohio State University writing bite-sized chunks about environmental science where the faculty are the editors of this volume. They're perfectly capable of doing this. This is within the open textbook platform called Pressbooks. And of course, it could be ancillaries, not even just open textbooks like students creating worksheets for group work in a genetics class, for example, or more. This area of open pedagogy is growing, and what's slightly hidden from you is the title of that website, which is just openpedagogy.org. This is the Open Pedagogy Notebook, which Robin DeRosa, who I pointed to a moment ago, and I co-founded. It's a space where anyone can go and browse through examples of open pedagogy in practice, but it's also a space where every week we're getting submissions from people around the world sharing what they're doing with open pedagogy, whether it's a new kind of assignment, whether it's giving students more agency in the architecture of the course or something else. It's much easier to pick up on this stuff if you can see an example that's concrete in your discipline. And that's what we're really trying to provide over here. Another resource I'll point to is a guide to making open textbooks with students, which is really about open pedagogy and not just textbooks but even detailed operational things, like here's a sample MOU for when you, you're working with your students to perform some kind of public scholarship and you, your students are interested in openly licensing their intellectual property, which of course should be their call, but how would you do that? There are sample MOUs for how you might do that with your students. So of course, this is a space where I think libraries are easily able to partner with teaching and learning centers in particular, but of course you can support a lot of this yourself as well hidden again, sorry for that. But what I'm showing you over here is a quick screenshot of one uh, major page on our library's website. Uh, during Open Access Week, just last month, we launched Opus at Kwantlen, our open publishing suite. And you can see that whether it's uh, inviting faculty to create and adapt uh, open textbooks using the Pressbooks platform, whether it's starting new open access journals using open journal systems, OJS, uh, whether it's getting Z cred ready, as we say, which is you know, getting ready for that zero textbook cost initiative that leads to credentials, uh, working with liaison librarians, even to embed permalinks to library resources into the learning management system uh, or anything else, searching for OERs, submitting work to the institutional repository, which we call Cora. This is a very, very uh, strong partnership between the Office of Open Education and the library. So even though some of these elements of open pedagogy might need to be championed by the teaching and learning commons, libraries have a big, big, big role to play in all of this. I'll also point to this resource. See, normally if I had published this book and if it was uh, not openly licensed, I would feel some degree of conflict of interest, but I feel none. This is a book that I, uh, I co-edited that came out last year. Uh, the whole book is licensed CCDY, so you can download it today. 
Uh, there's no issue. You're not going to have to spend a penny. But I'm sharing it with you because there are two chapters in this edited volume that have been written by librarians who are really lead, uh, leading uh, a big open education initiative at their institutions. And they've shared very, very specific strategies about how they've done this and some of the barriers they've managed to circumvent uh, from very different kinds of institutions. Quill West is from Pierce College, which is a community college that's done a lot of work with OER. Uh, and of course, Anita Waltz is from Virginia Tech University, a large research institution uh, in the United States. So I invite you to read their chapters and download them as well. And I'll also point to this. This is not a resource that exists yet, but this should be out within the next two months. Uh, this is also going to be openly licensed, CCBY, coming out from Pacific University Press. Uh, Andy Weselick, Ann Langley, and Jonathan Lashley. Uh, OER, a field guide for academic librarians. Um, Nicole Allen, who was here a couple of days ago, has a chapter in this book. Uh, I do as well. So it's an edited volume, but again, openly licensed. There are also colleagues of ours who are developing curriculum uh, for MLI MLIS programs right now, funded by the American Library Association. There's a lot of resources coming. And one of the things I've been delighted to see is increasingly commonly in North America, at least, there's a new position within libraries, OER librarian, a position by itself. So I wanted to wrap up just with a couple of things, but really first is a reminder about what the values of openness are. Because openness is very much about access. And this is true whether you're talking about open access publishing, whether it's open science practices, or whether it's open education. But it really is equal parts about agency. So for faculty thinking about, for example, the permissions to adapt, revise, contextualize content, permissions they wouldn't have if it was fully all rights reserved copyrighted. Certainly agency for students, especially when you're talking about open pedagogy, students should have the choice to perform public scholarship or not. Students should have the choice about what open licenses apply to their intellectual property and so on. But making sure that student agency is a big part of what we're doing. Because I think once we support these two things, access and agency, we are facilitating a lot more, whether it's collaboration in real time or over time, for example, transparency, and of course, deeper things like social justice, like making sure that people who can most benefit from the research we publish at our institutions can actually access the work. It's not hidden behind a paywall, that our disciplines can actually replicate our findings because of course our research materials and our data are shared openly that we can trust the findings because of the transparency of pre-registering hypotheses. So we're not engaging in data malpractice, for example. And of course, that we're able to provide wider access to tertiary education. So I'll stop there, but I really thank you for, for listening. And I hope, I think looking at the clock, we should have at least 20 minutes uh, for a bit of a discussion. So thank you very much for listening. And I hope that was useful. Thanks very much, Rajiv. And um, Adrian, I think uh, Adrian Stagg is going to moderate our online questions. So you might like to uh, unmute your mic. Adrian. Yes, yes, I have. Hello, Nerida. Do you have a qu Hi, Adrian. Do you have a question uh, from our online attendees that you'd like to put to Rajiv? Otherwise, I'll look for some questions from our floor. At this point, no. I will say that the online participants certainly did get quite involved in the elevator pitch exercise. So I'd encourage people to take a look in there. Uh, but what we might do is give them a short amount of time to pose any questions in the chat and uh, we can go to our face-to-face -face cohort in the meantime. Okay. Does anybody have a question here from the floor? Or else I've got one Please. that I might start with. Um, how have commercial publishers responded to the open education movement? It's been interesting. Um, so I got this question actually the other day when I was at USQ as well. So, and I gave rather a longish answer to it. So I, I'm, I'm at risk of being long again. But I will say um, commercial publishers are, are, have been very different in how they've responded to the open education movement. Um, for example, when OpenStax, the Open Textbook Project emerged out of, out of Rice University, uh, Wiley, the commercial publisher, very quickly partnered with them to say that if, if faculty are gonna move away from our textbooks and adopt these textbooks, we can at least create services that wrap around these textbooks and we'll sell those services. So that's an example of a business model that's em emerged that's sometimes referred to as open wrapping, 
where you know, homework platforms that commercial publishers sell to students um, for you know, 25 bucks a semester or something like that, but really guaranteed to get that from all students if faculty want that facility. But initially, um, you know, open text, uh, oh, sorry, commercial publishers initially really started denying that this was an issue. This is not a threat. They sort of ignored it. Then they started actively uh, uh, sowing seeds of doubt and spreading myths about OER. Uh, so for example, one really popular one uh, from the com commercial publishers was that, well, if the content is available for free, how good could it be? Uh, and that of course is uh, a simple fallacy that overlooks the fact that they're not produced for free, even, they, even if they're openly licensed. Um, you know, the Hewlett Foundation by itself has spent more than $100 million funding open textbook development over the last 10 years. So this is heavily funded. Faculty are usually compensated for their labor, given a lump sum up front when the book is openly licensed, instead of having to recover the, the compensation from the students. So anyway, uh, and then more recently, we're in the third phase, I think, which is more co-option, where commercial publishers are now actively trying to get out of the textbook industry. They've been very clear about this, very transparent. President of McGraw-Hill, for example, uh, presented a, three years ago at EDUCORS talking about how the textbook, the traditional textbook is a dinosaur and they're really trying to move away from uh, resources to services like the kinds of platforms I mentioned. Um, but now you have commercial publishers from Cengage to Pearson to others who are at risk of engaging in what might be called open washing. So this is, uh, other people call this FOPEN instead of open if you will. And so this is where they are enclosing open educational content within their proprietary platforms, which is actually not a thing you should be doing at all. Um, so they're trying to include them in their platform so that, uh, 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 and we are trying to push them in turn uh, to say that if you're gonna have open content on your platforms, it should be accessible without creating a, a, an account or logging in. It should be clearly marked, it should be downloadable and so on but they're really sort of mixed in terms of how they're responding. Some of them are trying to do things. So for example, we were pushing Cengage when they launched their, their platform earlier this year to say, you can't just be a parasite and you know, take open content into your repository and give nothing back. You're going to be a poor citizen of the commons if this is really something you're interested in doing. Uh, and they did, to their credit, released three of their commercial textbooks that were you know, up to date. Um, with an entirely open license, a CCBY license, and they placed those three books in the OER Commons repository. They bought the rights back from the, from the authors by paying the authors a lump sum in order to do that. So they vary. So I would say they're still figuring it out. There seem to be some people within some of the commercial textbook companies that are interested in moving this forward in the right way, but I fear at the moment they are up against a massive amount of culture change that would need to take place. Um, and they're still um, you know, spinning out new editions of textbooks with only cosmetic editions. They're still uh, 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 enclosing open content behind a paywall, which is ridiculous. Um, and they're still, um, in fact, Cengage in particular, pointing to the plight of st student food insecurity, which is something they have made worse um, as a way of marketing their own digital delivery platforms. So they're still engaging in quite a bit of open washing, but it's been changing. So I'm optimistic that it will keep changing. I do think there's a business model for them, but I will also say that I, have, I am absolutely certain that the open textbook movement would not have had the success it has, the momentum it has gained, if it were not for the nefarious practices of the publishers. So in a way, I'm grateful for them. So, yeah. Please. Are there any challenges of integrating open educational resources into commercial learning management systems like Blackboard? No, not really. Um, so you can uh, embed uh, open educational, uh, you know, open textbooks, open content into your learning management system quite easily. Um, one of the platforms that's used, uh, most widely used, for open textbooks in particular, is something that's called Pressbooks. And one of the things that Pressbooks is coming out with now uh, are open, um, um, uh, there's an LTI functionality. So then you can embed the open textbook content within your learning management system instead of having to actually import it, you know, embed it from an external site even. So no, there's, uh, there's no restriction and there's no issue with that. Um, what it comes down to is the license of the work. So 
if you create a derivative version of the content and you put that in your repository and it's perfectly fine to do that. But if the license has a share alike clause, which is very technical, but it really means that if you make changes, you can make changes, but you should share your derivative work back with the comments with the identical license. So then you should share it back, but that doesn't prevent you from sharing it with your students behind the LMS uh, um, login. Because of course you can use it in other ways. You can sort of take advantage of your learning management system, student tracking to see how much they're reading the content that's in the LMS. You can do other things like that, but no, there's no uh, legal problem with that or technical problem with that. But thanks for asking. So I had a, thanks very much. It was a great Thank presentation. You. I had two points and I wondered if you, you might comment on them. One of them is that an obvious response to commercial publisher reaction is that as time goes by, some OER products, of course they're, not, they're never finished, are actually uh, undisputedly the best quality resource for that particular area of education. Right. Yeah, and that, that happens over a period. But one of the questions I heard discussed um, earlier this year at the Creative Commons Summit in Toronto was the issue of these really high quality open education resources, which might have multiple authorship, having one channel, which is to <clears throat> people, uh, faculty be, will be very ready to take part, but they want attribution mostly. They want to be recognized for having done that. And they don't want to lose it as it becomes a more and more multiply authored thing. Right. That was that was one observation. Yeah. Uh, second one is is not about that so much, but it's about a particularly Australian condition, which we will become much more aware of next year. And that is that um, there is a conflict in uh, looming between the sector, the universities, and the copyright agency, which is the major collecting society in Australia. And it's precisely about uh, trying to control um, and, and extract payment from the use of education materials. This is sort of the, the converse argument to OER. Yeah. So that makes our landscape a little bit interesting next year. Yeah, and in some, in some ways, I mean, I'm going to start at the end maybe. Um, in some ways, this is, I think, similar to what's happening in other spaces with the open access push. I think in Europe, some countries, in fact, have been pushed so far in this space and the opaqueness of some of the non-disclosure uh, clauses within the agreements and contracts that are signed uh, are frustrating people to the point of where it's broken the, the it's still sort of the store that broke the camel's back in some ways to push people uh, in institutions and countries towards open access. But um, where you started, I mean, in talking about how we might end up in a point where there is one sort of undisputed best resource that's open, I, I think that's sort of partly likely. And that's because I think when you talk about quality, one of the things that drives quality up in a pedagogical context is localization. So I think you could end up with a sort of genetic shell, which might be customized in various ways. But the, you know, I think you can look at quality in terms of how students perform, sure, in terms of faculty reviews and all of that. Uh, uh, but I think localization is a powerful driver of quality in, in some ways. Uh, and so in, to that extent, I think you will see more derivative versions. That sort of speaks to your second point about when you have this growing gaggle of faculty authors. Um, and of course, that is true. Uh, one of the things that's good about an adaptation is there is an obligation on the person who's adapting some content or improving it in some way to be quite transparent about what the changes were between the previous version and their version so that it's forked out in a way that makes it easy for other people to see, okay, this was the change. And so this is the version I want actually. Um, and so, yes, it's possible, but the amount of contribution uh, affects uh, uh, the extent to which somebody uh, would be considered a co-author, for example, versus it's just a, 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 some minor adaptation. So I think, and that's what's being calibrated right now. So I, I think you're not wrong uh, in, in that you, we are ending up with more and more authors. So my textbook that I worked on already had an author and then my colleague and I adapted it. And since then, uh, another faculty member in Texas improved it and another faculty member in Washington improved it. And now there's five of us uh, in the line, each of them significant adaptations and improvements. There is also the protection, which is that within the license, if somebody creates a derivative work um, in a way that um, introduces errors or things that I'm uncomfortable with, of course, the license gives me the protection of requiring uh, uh, that I no longer be associated with that version. But the open textbook platforms themselves are now developing ways of 
attributing things in the front matter of the, of the books, which makes this clearer. So I'm not disagreeing with you, but I, I sort of see the localization and the community authorship of these resources as a positive and a technical challenge that is being uh, uh, coped with through the platforms that are helping produce them in, in effect. But yes, um, so yes and yes, I suppose. Thank um, you. I think Adrian has oh, a question there. Yes. Uh, yes, so we've got uh, one of our audience members here, Jackie Wollstenholm, has asked, in a conversation about OER, the academics confused the issue with e-books and asked what other academics are doing for open textbook exams. Do you have suggestions on how to respond other than changing the form of the assessment? Sure, but I mean, in, in a sense, Adrian, I'll almost challenge you to answer that because it's certainly confounding the, the format of delivery with the nature or with the openness of the book. So um, how would you address this? I can put you on the spot. Certainly. Um, so this is something which um, obviously, uh, I don't know if Jackie is from QUT, but uh, certainly something that, that happens at USQ, where a, a much cheaper version of the book is sourced as an ebook. Uh, it is then added to the library. And uh, then, of course, there's an open book exam as part of it. And at that point, the, the issues start to loom large on how, uh, for example, 100 or 200 or 300 students uh, would then get access to a, a, um, an ebook. Mm -hmm. um, what I would do is I would be talking about the actual container here. So where ebooks often, especially when they are under a library contract, are still marketed in very outdated business models that often talk about maximum number of concurrent users, for example, despite the fact that replicating the book or allowing um, unlimited access is actually part of the reason why you would go digital in the first place. And then contrast that between an open textbook, which sure, they can be a digital copy, students can print them out if they wish and really get them to understand that we're moving from an ebook where there is limited access to an open textbook where there is unlimited access uh, that will probably spark some other discussions around the types of assessment because if you're going to allow students to bring along the textbook to the exam this presupposes perhaps that students are either going to bring an electronic device with them uh, on which the book is loaded, or what would be a terrible outcome is to require the students to bring a printed copy of the open textbook. That, that would be an awful solution. So I suppose that really it is disambiguating the, 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 the format, and also, as Rajib said at the very beginning, this is very much about the permissions, what we can do with the item, as opposed to what we can't. So I'd, I'd, inv I'd certainly invite you, Rajiv, to build on any of those. Yeah, no, thank you, Adrian. I really appreciate, I, th I agree with what you're, what you're suggesting. I would really almost want to stay with them in, in that sort of sp sore spot for a few more minutes uh, and get them to articulate the other problems that might be associated with the ebook, whether it's, for example, um, the ability for students to highlight, navigate, take notes in, spell out even more things that might be problematic uh, in a pedagogical sense with the ebooks that are coming from the commercial publishers. Again, usually ebooks come uh, confined within sometimes a specific app developed by a commercial publisher or certainly with some digital rights management with some restriction. So I'd want to talk about the, the problems and have them be very clear about what the problems are before uh, I, I introduce uh, uh, the power of open content uh, in various formats. But yes, I think it, it's absolutely an opportunity to introduce things. Of course, knowing as well that you may be having this discussion within a discipline, within a subject, where at least for the moment, there are not, uh, there is not a perfect open textbook that already exists in that space. And that's the case for some niche disciplines, for example. It's changing every week. But I think sort of having that discussion in a way that educates the faculty member, but makes it very clear for them to themselves what the specific issues are so that when the solution is available, uh, they are very readily able to uh, identify that those problems won't coincide. Um, yeah, I think, I, I think that's exactly what I would do. 
And to build on that even further, uh, one of the things that you mentioned is about meeting people where they currently are. And so often what I find when I'm speaking about open resources, whether they be text or otherwise, is really getting to the core with an academic staff member of what is the major challenge that you are facing within your course at the moment? Why have you come looking for something else? Sometimes what they're looking for can't be answered by open at which case you, you've got to be fairly uh, non-doctrinaire and point them in the direction of whatever is going to help. But I do find that a lot of the times, the affordances of open licensing and open pedagogy will actually help them. Uh, so I think that for any of us who are advocating, active listening and questioning, I think are our most powerful tools uh, by far. I quite agree. I think the relationship, especially if you're talking about liaison librarians and faculty, for example, the relationship is really key that to be open, to be honest. And if there is content, there is content. If there isn't, there really isn't. If it, if it exists, but it's not good enough, being clear about that. I think it is important that they trust, uh, trust you so that if and when the solution is available, they trust that when you present it to them, but still leaving it to them and that they know that you support and respect whatever choice they're going to make. So I think I've said, before that uh, a real sort of kiss of death for an open education initiative is when faculty feel like it's being mandated or forced down their throat in some way. Uh, and that's the last thing I would want. Uh, so as long as the faculty know that they can come to me for support, uh, but I fully support any choice that they would make, uh, my only desire is for them to make an informed choice. That's really it. Uh, so I appreciate what you're saying. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, we're just about at four o'clock, which is when the webinar is due to end. Fortunately, those of us who are here are going to stay on and have some afternoon tea, so we have time to continue the conversation. So I think I might bring the webinar to a close, and I'd like everyone to thank Rajiv. Um, it's been an excellent talk, and as I suspected at the beginning, a lot for us to think about as we wrap up our year in QLOC, but I think also gives us a starting point for next year. So thanks very much, Rajiv. Thank you, it's a real privilege. Thank you very much. Thank you. A bit of an advertisement for the USQ uh, campus in Toowoomba and it's a gorgeous Japanese gardens on that slide. Okay, and Adrian, thanks very much for your input and for moderating the online forum. My pleasure, Narita, and I'd also like to thank all of the folks who came along online and for engaging as thoroughly as you did. It was a pleasure to watch uh, some of the comments coming up through the, uh, the chat. Thank you.